for making decisions about their children's welfare and ultimately their lives and ultimately whether they live or die. Um, a man that I met recently in Ulster County on my travels who could not be here today, his son was um, virtually killed because of a judge's decision and he asked if I would read his story on my show, which I agreed to do, but then realized a man should read it. So I asked John Hurd to come and read his story. Uh, so anyway, I'm a man. that's right, John, you get the job. <laughs> you can read half of it. Shall we start? My name is Dan, and I am currently a resident, resident of Ulster County. I asked Joanne to read my story on her show, since it would be upsetting for me to do this. My son, Jason, died as a result of a custody decision rendered in 1982 by a New York State Supreme Court judge. Jason was four years old in 1976 when my wife, Kate, a former Miss Teen America, left me. She became involved with a musician who was fairly well known. He was also a heroin addict, and she too became heavily involved with the drug scene. We had joint custody of our son. Kate and her boyfriend moved from house to house. They did this and they couldn't get enough money together to pay the rent. I tried to be tolerant of this unbearable, unstable lifestyle, but I was very worried that our son was being neglected. Then one Saturday I went to pick up Jason as usual and the house was empty. They had all disappeared and later I found out owed a great deal of money to several people. I asked around about where they could have gone. The situation was especially difficult for me because in a small town they had both denigrated me and many people who had been friends or acquaintances heard utter, utter fabrications about me. For a time I was virtually shunned. But when they skipped town people seemed to reconsider and tried to be helpful. I hired a private investigator who discovered that they moved to California to a small town outside of Pasadena. I flew out immediately and took Jason from their house back to the airport. I called the police and told them that if they received a call about a missing boy, tell his mother his father was with him and he is safe. She had violated our New York custody decree by virtually kidnapping him, and so the two of us got a late night flight to New York. I gave Jason a wonderful life for the year I had him with me. I took him to several specialists and discovered that his illness was never properly diagnosed. Kate's doctor claimed he was epileptic, but he wasn't. He had neurological reactions that appeared to be seizures, but they weren't epilepsy. During these seizures, he was totally lucid, but his heart raced, and he wanted to hold on to me to make sure he was safe. When I bought, brought him to the doctor, he slowly weaned him off dialantin, since this is an epilepsy drug. He was then put on digitalis. Since that change in his medication, he never had another seizure. I had taken him to an excellent hospital where he was diagnosed as having stenosis, a heart ailment, treatable with digitalis. She took him somewhere in California and had him diagnosed as an epileptic, a result of a head injury when he was three years old. Perhaps I should have wondered about Kate at that time. She had taken Jason to a neighbor's home whose house was under construction. Kate and her friend sat down in the kitchen to have a cup of coffee and let Jason run amok. In the next room was a stairwell with no railing. Jason climbed up the stairs and fell. He landed on his head and fractured his skull. A bone splinter went into the right parietal, parietal area of his skull. He was taken to a medical center and had emergency brain surgery. This should have been the first indication of her incompetence as a parent, but I considered this an accident and never blamed her. During the year Jason was with me, Kate never tried to locate her son. She could have done that easily. She had my parents or my aunts to call. Undoubtedly, she was heavily into drugs in California at that time. Most of the money she and her boyfriend owed to people back east was money for drugs. Meantime, I moved in order to be near the hospital where Jason's doctor was. He was diagnosed with a rare malady called Williams Syndrome. Only one in 30,000 children have this disease, so it is pretty unusual. I was lucky to find a doctor who knew how to treat Jason, and with a lot of care, attention, and participation in his school, he was in special ed classes, I was able to modify his behavior and give him a happy, healthy life. 
But after a year, Jason wanted to call his mother. By this time, he was 10 years old. One evening, he called and told her the name of the school he was going to. Very quickly, things changed. She flew east the next day, and I was served with court papers to appear the following day, or I would be arrested. I hired two lawyers overnight, two friends who appeared with me in court. I was told to bring Jason to court. Despite the fact that Jason's special ed teacher, the school nurse, and the principal all came to court to testify on my behalf and explain how much time I spent with my son, and despite the fact that our original divorce decree stated Kate could not leave the county without my knowledge and consent, the judge awarded her immediate custody, and they left for California the next morning. In the courtroom, I explained to Kate and to her attorney about, and her attorney about the drug Jason was taking, and how well he was doing, and how dangerous it would be for him to go back on Dilantin. She didn't want to hear what I had to say, and claimed her doctors had the right answers. I told her that Jason could have life-threatening seizures if he went back on that drug again. Although he had no seizures for a year and was doing well in the digitalis, she stubbornly refused to concede that her doctors were wrong. Quote, just give me his clothes. I don't want to hear what you have to say, she said. The last time I saw them in that courtroom. Not long after that, I got the telephone call from her. Jason had died from a seizure. She had allowed the doctors to put him back on Dilantin. That was the last time I spoke to her. I called his doctor. Well, this was a rough one, was all he had to say. I guess I could have sued, but that wouldn't bring back my son. I didn't have the stomach for more lawyers and courtrooms. Now, when I think back on that time, it was the judge who awarded Kate custody who caused the death of my son and judges are never punished for making the wrong decision. Only children are, and those who love and care the most for them. Thanks, John. That was, I guess you could see why he couldn't come here and get involved in that. I wouldn't ask him, but anyway, this is just the extreme example of what happens when these judges make decisions of awarding a child to an unfit parent or a neglectful parent. And sometimes they can be women. Hey, I don't think the court, for many years, this decision was rendered almost 20 years ago when women almost automatically got custody. Today there are two million men have custody, primary custody of their children. That's a tremendous increase in the last 10 years. But I guess according to you, perhaps not enough. I don't know. Now, it's rare that you see a father with as a custodial parent, meaning that he has the child the majority of the time and the mother as the visitor. Normally, what I see and what our, our fathers see is that the mother is the custodial parent, the father is the non-custodial parent, and has a set visitation schedule. But th that is changing. There are two million custodial fathers in America today, and the increase in that has occurred in the last 10 years. The statistics were just came out. Actually, they mm -hmm. did a story on Father's Day about this, which was very interesting. Um, what I don't understand, and maybe you can explain since you've been in Albany with these legislators, is why in New York, 13 states in America, joint custody is given, is the norm, and any disparity to that has to be appealed. Why do you think New York State is not one of those states? Well, New York State is definitely behind the times when it comes to those type of decisions. I mean, uh, and, and John, I'm sure, can speak to this as well. We, as the, an organization, we go up to Albany every year and meet with our local legislators, and we have chapters throughout the state, so we hit every legislator, and we talk about the bills that we have proposed, the shared parenting, or joint custody is assumed, because that's where the problems begin. Automatically, when you walk into court, you're, you are already in a battle. Who is going to win? Who is going to win? Who is going to get custody? So already you're starting as an adversarial relationship, and the family court almost promotes that between the lawyers and the judges and the courts. But as I understand it, there's a woman in the assembly in New York State 
who refused to come on this show. She was invited, by the way. She's the person, her name is Helene Weinstein, who all the legislators told me to go see because she's the person who is heading up so-called changes in the divorce and custody laws. But she's been doing this for 10 years and nothing's been done. So my question, if she did appear, hey, Helene, yeah. What are you doing out there in Albany? Well, at uh, how much do they make a year? Judith K advocates the same kind of, you know, sensibility that, that they're they're all putting their heads together to come up with something new. They haven't come up with something new in ten years. Exactly what you said. None of them. And Kevin Cahill, our Ulster County Assemblyman, he is the only person besides Lee Weinstein who has refused to come on this TV show. And my feeling is it is strongly because. He doesn't have, well, maybe he has friends in Ulster County Family Court. I don't know, and he might, they might think him disloyal. But um, I, will, I will bring the letter he wrote me in response to his um, invitation to come here and talk about these issues, uh, which he should do, because we elected him. And I'm, I'm, I have questions. I did vote for him, but I, I re until he gives me a satisfactory answer, I'm not voting for him again. And I don't think any of you out there who are involved in these issues should vote for an assembly person who's afraid to discuss them on local television. Hey, what are we asking them to do, really? So are you finding this attitude amongst the legislators? Well, I find a lot of legislators accommodating when they meet with us, but the name Helen Weinstein has been mentioned several times. She is head of the Child and Family Committee, where a lot of these bills have been stalled for years. The shared parenting bill, a parenting terminology bill, where we simply want to change in terminology where a father is not referred to as a visitor, but a father is referred to as a parent. That bill has gone nowhere. So things as simple as that have been sitting in the, sitting in the assembly for long periods of time. These people have a do totally different agenda, and that is the criminalization of fatherhood. The criminalization of fatherhood simplifies their bureaucrat bureaucratic you know, uh, programming. I mean, well, if you criminalize that other parent, that so-called non-custodial parent, and I mean, I'm, I'm not, let's not get into that sexist thing, okay, because it's silly. I mean, the same thing would happen to a, a woman if she was a non-custodial parent. Let's call it the criminalization of the non-custodial parent. I mean, we, you have a bureaucracy, billion-dollar bureaucracy, that's set up around collecting child support. That, that, that's an enormous mandate to, to, to simply pick up checks and make sure that these poor mothers out there get there monthly. But, it, but at the same time that you're, you're, you're feeling Mr. Doogood and your political constituency is applauding you, you're also inadvertently criminalizing the person who's making the payment. You can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to be the bad guy in this system. Somebody has to be the bad guy in a legal system. Well, every time I've and had 95 on percent of the time, it's sure. dads. Every time I've had on Supreme Court judges on this show, um, including Ralph Beisner from Dutchess County, he said it's an adversarial system. That, that is what he sure said. Is. And and maybe we all go in there expecting some kind of fairness and justice and we keep well, forgetting and, that. Well, Giuliani's going through it now and complaining right. about it and the, 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 the exposure in the press and so on and so forth. But maybe that, his going through it is going to help focus attention, unfortunately, on these issues which 50% of all families are experienced divorce, and even if they don't go through it personally, their children or friends or other people, so just about everyone is touched by these issues. To have our assembly men and women not making laws on these issues, these are urgent issues as far as I can tell. And, uh, but, but not no, but to the, say... But to get back to the point, the, this Sharon Parenting Bill is never going to happen in this state where lawyers are making $250 an hour in contested litigation. Whether it's, and, and, and what could be more contestable than a child, than the right to parent your own child? So you have to go elsewhere. You have to go to constitutional law or you have to go to the very fundamental rights of the individual in this society, and that is your inalienable right to parent your own offspring, which is violated by the state on the basis of discretion of these judges. So it, 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 it's the judges. That, 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 that we want to focus on. It's them in being, it's the fact that we've empowered these people who are, or who are incompetent to come into your life and make decisions regarding the welfare of your children. They don't know your children. 
They haven't been. They have, I have a judge who rules in my son's life. Has met him once when he was three. Doesn't know where he lives. Doesn't know where he goes to school. She won't let this case come up here. She won't let this case. He won't. She won't award well, him she a law in New York City. Clarify that because she's, she's in, in New, New York, York City. City. She's held on to this case in spite of the fact that I've made several applications in, my, in Ulster County. She's obsessed with this case and protecting the mother, and that means. I'm the bad guy. So I don't go into court to say I want my son immunized, as far as they're concerned. I go into court to defend myself. So the minute I say I want to go into court like this, this man, like Dan, who says I want to go into court because my son needs this medication and not his mother's medication, <coughs> the inference here is that he's immediately criminalized. He's immediately thought of as a, as a, as a whatever. He's not capable. He's a man. He's not capable, he's not taking, you know, whatever he did to doctor his child summarily was dismissed, at least from what, from what I read. I, this judge, he, he brought in the nurse, he brought in the doctors. Where was the judge? Where was the judge listening to the facts and saying, gee, your son's done well for a year on this medication and not that, and then all of a sudden his child, he, the greatest tragedy in, I think, Possible to lose a child, but to lose a child to the incompetence of a judge or the bias of a judge, the bigotry of a judge. These yeah. people are not educated. They don't know. Well, what does this judge know about medications? This judge, what, what this, ju this judge, these judges are all of a sudden pharmacists, doctors, teachers. They have parental skills uh, from where? You know, maybe Hillary, from the way the they grew up. Supreme Court judge in Dutchess County came on my show. And I happened to just ask her about her children in passing. She never married or had children. Right. Now, she's making decisions every day. Now, I'm not saying that her decisions are any better or worse than the others, but just to give you an example of someone who was making these decisions in Dutchess County, never having had children or been married. So, you know, some people would say, well, she doesn't need to. She's part of the family. That's what she said when I asked her. But, you know, who, again, who are these people to be doing this? There isn't even a committee, so if some judge is biased, at least there's two or three people, three or you know whatever, to make decisions about custody for, for people. You're at the at the mercy of this one person. There well, I mean, even if you, even if you did have Oliver Wendell Holmes, you know, uh, on your case, I think that the first thing he would do would be to say, I can't, how should I know who, where your son should spend or daughter should spend with time with more when you should pick up, drop off, what rights you should have? Where did the government become so self-empowered by this uh, idea of divorce? And this, is the, this is what hopefully this show you know, will, will bring to light. Well, that these, people have, yeah. these, these people have assumed this mantle of power and it's not, it's not, it's not about anything but money. They don't know your son, your daughter. They, 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 this is just not possible for them to know. And where they beg off. I mean, I've never been to court where one of these people didn't make a speech about the parents tearing the child in two. That, that they seem to be especially talented to, you know, in. But that's why they're incriminating the parent. Mm -hmm. They want to incriminate the parent because we, oh, and then you realize you're tearing this poor little boy in two. But that's why there are law guardians. There, there are law guardians assigned to um, mediate this. But I was going to ask you, how did you get involved in this situation and as the head of father's rights? Did you have, what was your story? Well, my situation was such that uh, when I was initially separated, uh, which is the result of a uh, accusation made where I was removed from the house, I was arrested, I was uh, mistreated by my local police force, I got my name in the paper, I almost lost my job. Um, Excuse me. There's nothing to be done. Okay. You got a little buzz going on here, sorry. sorry Andrew. So, uh, the fact was I, I was out of my house, I almost lost my job, I was told I couldn't see my kids. She wanted a divorce and came up with some accusation. Is that what yes, you was, Yes, yes, that's, that's definitely what happened. And I, I actually, I can't remember how I came across the Father's Rights Association, but when I finally did, 
you know, these were guys that had been through or had gone through what I was going through. And they more or less put my head on story. And I actually ended up getting arrested uh, two or three more times based on, again, violating an order of protection, which if you look at somebody the wrong way, you, you can be arrested. Yeah. So I had a lot of legal problems. I had myself in a lot of hot water. Okay, but once I got involved with the Father's Rights Association, I started to see how the court system worked. I started to see how the legal system worked. I sort of learned the do's and don'ts of how to handle yourself in the courtroom. And now this is almost five years later. Uh, I'm hoping to again become uh, a custodial parent. So and how old are your children? And my, my children are six and ten years old. And are they girls? They are two. Yeah, I have two girls. Mm -hmm. So she was awarded custody? Due we to had that? joint custody. You okay, did. She was a custodial parent. And at the time I thought, well, that's fine. She's the mother. I guess that's the way it should be. And I'll see my kids and everything will be fine. We lived in the same town. Uh, kids, my oldest was going to school, so I didn't see any problem with that. But then the problem started where uh, she had a boyfriend who was a drug abuser who was around the kids. She started to move from town to town. She actually just moved for the fourth time. My kids, if she has it her way, will be in their fourth school in the fall. So uh, oh, I've been oh. to, I've, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've been to family court, either for custody or visitation or child support. And the judges don't, support. who you, the judge who you have, doesn't see a problem with her parenting or the well, kinds I'm, of things? Well, I'm hoping when we go back into court at the end of this month that this judge will see that my petition states that the children are going to their fourth school. Okay, that they're moving for the fourth time in four years. To me, that's an open and shut case. To me, that says there's something wrong here. She's been evicted from her last two apartments. What did she accuse you of? Uh, harassment. Harassment. Uh, abuse. I, I, harassment. I, I, abuse. I've been domestic wait, violence. Wait, my husband Blocking we were accused me of harassment, called the police. and, and Calling too many times. And they, because um, we were living in a house divided. But the police, to their credit, in Woodstock, did not arrest me, even though when I came home from taking my son to school, he said, arrest that's her. That's because you're a girl. So mm -hmm. I know it's because, you know, again, there were orders of protection. They didn't understand how you can file an order of protection against somebody you're living in the same house with. Right. It's been done. I mean, uh, I'm also in a situation where now it's the shoes on the other foot where she's harassing me. I've been trying to get an order of protection in the town I live in now. I've since moved. And again, if it was me, and I hate to say this, I mean, I would have been arrested in jail for the things that she's done. Right. So to get an order of protection now against her has been very difficult. And uh, really? Oh yes. I have to tell you, my my husband just went right down and boom, boom, boom. They did it, and then my my lawyer had told me to do it first, and I said I would never file such a thing. That's horrible. Well, 24 hours later, he filed one against me. So of course I filed one against him. Right. I mean, you know. What's a it's person about, to do? I mean, about, I don't understand it. There were no grounds. This was nonsense. Yeah, but right. you're getting off the point. What is your you point? All, the point is the judges, not the fight you're having with your ex. This is true. They want us all to fight amongst themselves. They want themselves. you to talk about your ex, and your ex to come in and defend himself and talk about you and vice versa. That's what they want to talk about. They don't want us sitting on this show talking about them. They don't want us talking about Vincent Bradley being a liar. They don't want to bet, talk about Joe Taraka being deaf in both ears and totally incompetent. They don't want to talk about that. And going through now a divorce you want to, when he was hearing like my divorce case. Mm -hmm. so. They don't want to talk about what the money that they're getting, the kickbacks, the slush funds, the so on and so forth, that they're all part of in their awarding, you know, what they're running up fees and awarding uh, and there are and playing this game of picking, a, uh, picking the parent. There are exceptions to the rule. A man stopped me on the street in Woodstock and said, because of Karen Peters, who was family court judge 15 years ago, is now in the appellate court, she awarded him sole custody, you know, custody of his son. And he raised his son, and his daughter is now 15, 16. So he was very grateful to her. That is an exception. That is an exception. That's a rarity. He did tell me that. He made a point of coming up to me on the street to tell me. So uh, Karen Peters did. I've only heard good things about mm -hmm. her. I don't know. She's now an appellate court judge, so maybe that's good. Um, I think it is. In any case, um, do you have something to read about this, John? You said you were going to read Well, I think it's just more important to keep the focus on these criminals who run this system than it is to, you know, 
call our ex's names. I yeah. All right. I, so I, this is a guy named Stephen Baskerville. He's very what? What's the word? Well, he's very articulate about incriminating this court system. And I wish that I had more time because I've got to highlight a few of the things that he's written. Well, what's the gist? And the incompetency of these people, and why are we letting these people decide who gets what as a result of splitting up with our? Well, I know one of the things Stephen Baskerville talks about, the family court was an experiment started in the 1960s. Really? Oh, yes. And Stephen Baskerville is very outspoken about how this is. And he's also been on shows, and they, 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 they what's his name, that guy, Matthews, uh, MSNBC. Yeah, Matthews. Does. Chris Matthews. Chris Matthews. Hardball. They just go after him because they do not want to believe that a father's concern for his children is what's motivating his request for a change in, the, in, this, in, these, in this crap that's going on. They think it's all like the now organization thinks that all, it's, all that's motivating this is that men don't want to pay child support. So, you know, you want to spend more child with their, time with their kids to avoid paying support. And that's, what the, that's the spin and twist that they put on everything. And I think one of these things, no fault divorced gave judges, at least uh, at the request, no fault divorce gave judges at the request of one half of the couple the right to decide when a marriage had irre irretrievably broken down, she points out. Judges are not only availing themselves of this right, they are offering lucrative financial and emotional incentives to parents, usually mothers, to request the divorce. These incentives usually include virtually automatic child custody and the power to expel, plunder, and criminalize the father. By rewarding the spouse who files for divorce, judges can increase the business of their courts, as Charles Dickens predicted, and the scope of their power. They can also return enormous earnings to the attorneys, psychotherapists, and others who fall within their patronage and have a professional interest in increasing the volume of divorce litigation in fatherless children. children. So this man is talking about what, what I think we're, we need to focus on in this show is how these judges and these lawyers are running a racket using our kids to award themselves enormous sums of money. For example, I just requested of my judge, Gangle, whatever, in, in New York, I wrote her a simple letter and said I'd like to speak to my son on Sundays. I, it, it had, you wouldn't believe how long. I've gotten... 16 letters back, running me around, telling me I can, and saying yes and then saying no, that I had to file legal papers and I couldn't just make the request of the mail, although the mother's done this repeatedly, and then saying no, you can't, and then the mother's saying, well, the camp that he's going to this summer says that you can't speak to him on the phone there. You're gonna you go ahead and cough. And if you add it up, what it would take to make this, this list this simple request, why do I have to make this request in the first place, when one wonders, you know, to talk to my own child? And why do I have to ask a judge for permission to talk to my son? <coughs> well, what you're saying is they want you to spend they want a me, lot of the, money. The, the, to get the money that would have been spent to make, and I, and I deliberately made this a simple request, the money that I would have spent by would probably be ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for two attorneys, and then they make me pay all the fees. They make me pay all the legal fees, and then they denigrate my request as frivolous and sanction me if I come into court with such frivolous requests in the future by somehow imagine, somehow pulling out of thin air the fact that that request has already been uh, judiciated somewhere you know, five years ago, and you shouldn't have made it in the first place. And it is such an, it's just such an enormous runaround. It's, an, it's a fascinating thing. If it, you know, to watch this Judge Gangle Jacob bend over backwards to cover her trail, to cover her lies, to cover her manipulations. And even in the same letter that she denies me the right by letter to speak to my son, she awards the mother by the right to, to cut off my telephone contact when he's at camp. I mean, I can't make sense out of this in 15 minutes, but it's it, because it's such an enormous... But the gist you know of it is, she sure. wants you, just to make an 8 o'clock phone call to your son, because you're not allowed to She wants me to make will. a formal legal right. application, which would cost whatever it would take for to retain an attorney. For a Sunday night phone call. Yeah. For a simple Sunday night phone for call. For any, any telephone contact. So when do you see your son or talk to your son? You can't call him up. He's 13. Can't you just talk no. to him anytime? No. You I have, no. She has to, I have to call 
on certain Tuesday night at eight o'clock. What if you're? Yeah. What if I'm? Never mind. That's it. Uh, no. No sorry, matter what. No, that's it. Don't talk Tuesday to your son. night at eight o'clock. That's yeah. it. And then you. And these rules have been nothing but what this judge has come. This incompetent moron. This sexist bigot. She's a heinous human being. What did New York Magazine call her? She, this is all she's come up with. New York Rules. Magazine called her a man-hating judge. As I, I read that. The article she, on the She's typical, as far as I'm concerned, of judges. And naming names is what this, the, the, this show needs to do. Oh, I have no... Hey, I'm not afraid. I've named my judges and how, what a These terrific job they've done. These people are incompetent. They work for the government, first of all. You know, they don't work for, you know, some place that teaches them how to operate in the best interest of a, of a child. Well, I bet a law school doesn't give them any the, child the, development courses. The way, that, the way that they operate in the best interest of a child is by denigrating its parents, his parents or her parents. That's their, you know, Judge Marianne Mizell had to make this big speech. For five minutes, I had to listen to this woman who had spent maybe 30 seconds on my case call both the mother and me names before leaving her courtroom, before she shuffled my case back down to New York City to gangle. And I can give you 150 examples. I mean, I can give you, and I can give you things that this judge has written, like, for instance, the fact that my son can't be immunized because he hasn't suffered, quote, any of the diseases for which immunizations are provided. Or well, the logic escapes me. That means that my son virtually, according to what she wrote, and I can read it to you yeah. right here, my son has to get polio before he can get a vaccination for polio. This is Gangle Jacob. Yeah, in New this York. is, and this is the extent of months of of sitting in front of this judge or waiting for the court to rule, or or you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of applications, contesting, going back and forth, not talking about the issue, but you know, responding to papers that are non-responsive, as they say, all because what the focus on is is on in my case is what a bad man I am. You know, I slapped my wife, my girlfriend, so I'm a bad person. But your wife, your ex, the mother of this boy, never vaccinated her son, and that's considered being a good mother as well. Well, there's done. an instance where one judge took custody away from a doctor, woman, because she didn't believe in immunization, and she corroborated it, and awarded custody to the, to the other parent because the mother didn't believe in immunization. That should have said Now, in my case, yeah. the judge is saying, well, there's a great deal of controversy, but she doesn't put it on paper. She writes down no expert opinion. She cites no uh, case history, law, anything. She just says off the top of her head, there's a lot of controversy. So the state can't be telling the custodial parent whether or not they can or can't. They have to or don't have to immunize their children. So in one instance, the state can tell you. If you want to go to public school, supposedly you have to be immunized. If my son is going to a camp this summer, it says he, that he has to be immunized. So that somehow is being waived, but at the same time, the camp also says we don't want a lot of telephone calls from parents while the kid is at camp. But that's being enforced. Consistency. So it's ar it's totally ar it's ar it completely arbitrary. arbitrary, and it is run by. And it's by completely incompetent. And it's in the in the sad case of Dan, God bless him. I'm, you know, it's life threatening because certainly not immunizing my son. Is, is life threatening if, by our by our standards? Well, if she today. to come out of the country to some third world country in the summer on a vacation, I would be worried sick that he's going to pick up some kind of thing. I mean, well, I'm I'm worried sick too, but I'm I'm not downplaying the sensibility that there are people who don't believe in immunization. You know, I'm not I don't want to take on that contingency of people out there. And I'm only saying that in my case, in a court of law, where the issue was. Uh, what was the word promulgated where it was brought up it was dealt with ineptly mm -hmm. it was not dealt with professionally it was not dealt with by bringing in professional opinion or expert medical witnesses. opinion yeah. arguing a case a, a portfolio blah 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 it, it was, was, it, by, it was by, by Phyllis Gangle Jacob decided one afternoon to pull something out of her butt about immunization and wrote it down on a piece of paper and it says he doesn't have to be immunized because he doesn't have any of the diseases for which immunizations are provided and that's a direct And you quote read that and go, I just spent five hundred thousand dollars for that. <laughs> it's good you have a sense of humor, John. And, and, and well, 
and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't know how many other men or women out there that this has happened to. And what I think would be interesting is to bring these orders in front of the camera and name the names of these judges that have, that have, that have written, actually written this insanity down. You know, what police is your visitation rights, for example? Why do you pick your son up one hour after school on Friday? Right. Because I can tell you by picking my son up one, after, one hour after school on Friday, that means he has to get in the bus, drive all the way home, he's home for 10 minutes, and then he has to get back in the car and drive back down the way he just came to a gas station where I pick him up. And this judge wrote this rule with, you got me, what, what the sense of that could possibly be, <coughs> or why he has to go home, you know, why he sees me, my son sees me a Wednesday, then he sees me a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday, then he'll see me another Wednesday for three hours, then he has no contact with me Thursday through Tuesday. And that's why you wanted the Sunday phone call. He yeah. is 13. And that's the law. I mean, and the, you look at the law and you say, this is a law. Now, some cop to read this, if I called my son on a Sunday night, something came up. Something happened. He could come to my house and arrest me. And that's another thing that the, a lot of people are complaining about. These judges are writing uh, law. They're writing stuff into law from the bench at their discretion. Gangle Jacob is, 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 is the darling of the attorneys in New York City right. because that thing he told me she's, uh, yes. she's extended a personal, personal injury, a personal injury attorney who I know well, who practices in Manhattan but has a, and lives in Woodstock part time, told me. Um, and I've heard consistently from lawyers like him who I've met who've appeared before her that she is not, it is not a pleasant experience. I mean, it seems it's not just you. All those people out there who might think it's a personality difference between you and this judge. Well, she's extended where the law says you have 30 days to file a personal injury claim. She's, she's extended, extended it 90 days. So that has so which is which is heaven for the attorneys. Right. Right. So they love it. So he explained this to me because he knows what I'm doing here with the divorcing, and I went, oh. Anytime I've made an application <laughs> in front of this judge that my son be come to live with me. In the absence of his mother working, she goes away to work. The, she complains in her papers that she tries to paint this picture that I brought my that that, that, that she was going to judiciate. What do you call the word? Judiciate. She was going to hear this argument. She brought my son down, and then I withdrew the application. But she she leaves out the fact that I made the application in June, a month before the mother was going to go away to work. And the judge only consented to hear the application in September, two months after the mother returned home from work. Now, what would, what would that tell you about your chances on that on that application in that court? I mean, that, it would have told you you should have applied in time. January for July, but she could have delayed it six months instead of two months. Well, That's the fact of the matter is, the mother went away to work, left my son living with her boyfriend alone, right? Who apparently has more rights than his own father. When you're ten and minutes down the road, waited two months until she got back to hear something that was put in front of her the, a month before she left, and then questions your sanity for withdrawing it. The, yes, and then tries to make me look like a frivolous litigator for uh, uh, making this application and then withdrawing it at the last minute, which Wait. is a lie. It's a it's a it's a it constitutes a fraud on the part of a, of a Supreme Court judge. But these kinds of situations are humiliating and demeaning and and what I would like is for all of you out there because I'm sure there are many of you who watch my show and many of you stop me in the mall and on the street and say this happened to me this happened I would like other people to come on and talk about these things about and name the judges it's time that we did this in fact if there is a judge where are there the judge in my case actually I'm collecting names because we're gonna have a whole show for him the hearing examiner um, I have three people who have outrageous things he did. And this guy should be off the bench, but one of the problems, and maybe you know about this too, there is a judicial conduct board in Albany, but the judges can't be brought up for making poor decisions on the, uh, regarding the welfare of a child. A kid dies, well, the judge can't be brought up because of his decision. It only has to be their so-called conduct you know, probably, again, a capitalist society like this, it all reverts to money. 
Did he take a bribe? Oh, then these people would be all over him. But if a kid died, hey, it happens. That seems to be the attitude. Well, but removing a father from the life of a child, I would say, places a child in imminent you know, Absolutely. Harm, in harm's way. Uh, the, the government study, a friend of mine called me up and said the gov a government study just, just showed that 60% of child abuse is perpetrated by women. Second on the list is stepfathers, boyfriends. Mm -hmm. So the, the, you know, my beef here is, is the criminalization of dad sim for the, simply to collect the bucks. And that's what, what's going on. Although... I mean, there's guys in jail because they can't make their child support payment. They're arrested on the spot. They come to your house, they put you in a squad car, you're in jail. You know, there's right. no... But it's happened to women. I mean, to get... I have a problem with the men-women thing, but there is a book written by a woman who's never been married, by the way. She worked in consumer uh, analysis for Mark Green in Manhattan. She's a journalist and consumer affairs expert. She wrote a book called Divorced from Justice, The Abuse of Women and Children by Divorce Lawyers and Judges. You know, I read the book. It's a book I needed before. And you might as well change women to men in some mm -hmm. instances. And, and here's the back copy. Contact with the divorce court system may be extremely dangerous. You may lose your children, your home, your life savings, and your health. Before you enter a divorce lawyer's office or courtroom, read this book to protect yourself and your children. Well, you know, here we go again. I, I'm just saying that I think the law, the judges, are in some instances blind to what, which parent it is that they're screwing over. Right. I haven't met many people that are happy with their family court experience. And the other thing is that a family court judge serves 10 years. Right. So normally, you know, you may have that judge for a lot of your, your child's lifetime. And if they get elected twice, then that's, that's your, your child's Do you know that Mary work in Ulster County ran unopposed? And I went to the head of the Republican Party in Ulster County and I said, why don't you put up someone to run against her? I'll run this campaign. And you know what? Nobody wanted the job. And I almost feel that the Republicans, because they cross-endorsed, they, they want, it's like they throw a bone to the Democrats, let them have the family court, as you said. It's an, it was an experiment gone amok. Let me read this. Let's, let's read. Yeah, we have time. In Los Angeles, former Deputy, Deputy District Attorney Jackie Myers told the Los Angeles Times she left office in 1996 because, quote, we were being told to do unethical, very unethical things. Myers is not alone. Quote, I got a call from a homeless shelter and was told that I had put a man and his four children out on the street because I had put an, uh, because I had put an enforcement order for 50% of his income. Did that make sense? Should we read that again? Yeah, I don't get that. I got a call from a homeless shelter and was told that I had put a man and his oh. four children out on the street because I had put an en because I had put an enforcement order for fifty percent of his income. Oh, oh. Ex deputy ex, ex district attorney Elisa Barker recalled, quote, that was the first time I was in touch with the ramifications of what I was doing. Men are now forced to support children who are acknowledged not to be theirs biologically. Stepfathers are ordered to pay support for stepchildren. Grandparents are set and second wives are pursued by child support prosecutors. Minor boys statutorily and forcibly raped by adult women must pay child support by, to the criminals who raped them. A presumption of guilt also pervades allegations of domestic violence made during custody proceedings where a father's contact with his children is criminalized through restraining orders that are routinely issued with no evidence of wrongdoing whatever. Orders that cannot protect anyone because they criminalize not violence, which of course is already criminal, but a father's contact with his own children. Family law is now criminalizing rights as basic as free speech. In many jurisdictions, it is now a crime to publicly criticize family court judges. We're going to get arrested. Hey. <laughs> and fathers have been jailed for doing so. In a paper funded by the Justice Department, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Just Judges, an association of ostensibly impartial judges who sit on actual cases, attacks fathers' groups for their political opinions and activities. No figures are available on how many fathers are incarcerated for family crimes, quote-unquote. Informal estimates, estimates put as much as one-third of the nation's jail population consisting of fathers on contempt of court charges. Informal estimates put as much as one-third of the nation's jail population 
consisting of fathers on, con on contempt of court charges. Some jurisdictions now propose creating forced labor camps, especially for fathers to relieve overcrowded jails. Not since the fall of the Weimar Republic has a democracy treated millions of its own citizens in this fashion. Now this is what this guy writes to his documented. He's a teacher at Howard University. Uh, without getting into the sexist issue. Yeah, but that Howard University is a black university. The and it happens and mostly to black men. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's, yeah, that's yeah. more of an issue even for them. But a lot of these men and women never marry, more so than in the white community. Not that that, I mean, you weren't married either, but generally, by and large, that's the case. Although, you know, that... You realize that as a father, <clears throat> if you die, and you have young children, you are forced to buy a life insurance policy by the government. You are forced to maintain a life insurance policy for, <laughs> for uh, minor children in the event of your death. How can they make it? So that you are actually paying child support from, from the grave. Beyond. From the grave. <laughs> they can make you do that. I have. Not really. Yes. I don't know if your orders. No, this, my this orders. Is, you know, like I read that and I said, I think that's illegal. I think it's unethical. And a child which support. constitutes a, 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 a judicial connection with life insurance companies. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's the first thing. That, there's a conflict right. of interest there. The insurance else. companies have their hand in the till too. It's not right. just the lawyers. The so you're talking people. money. Yeah, it's all money. And it's all what these money. judges and lawyers are getting away with? Stealing our children. And putting money in their pocket over, you know, the the man and the and the woman fighting about it. Well, I get two hundred dollars a month child support from a millionaire, and then there are men in Ulster County who are middle class who are paying a lot more than two hundred a month. Oh, sure. And this happened in Ulster County, oh, so sure. go figure that out. Right. So you know, there is no rhyme or reason to any of this, whether it's financial or whether it deals with the children's welfare. I don't. I, I've been in that court. You've been there. Do you see any consistency? I don't see any competency. Is I think the point. I don't, I don't see, see anybody there that has any thing close to what I would trust as a concern for any child, much less mine or yours. But I think that the I don't whether, whether it's populace. the cops standing there at the the frisk you when you walk into the building, whether it's the stenographer who lies and changes what's 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 actually been said you know I mean there's mm -hmm. many instances of that covering up for the judge you know screaming at you calling you names telling you you're an idiot telling you to shut up demeaning you denigrate making denigrating remarks I mean I've been in court a lot of times and I'm not it's just not just the old axe to grind but I'm telling you those courtroom buildings themselves are a disgrace their dumps. You know, these people are not living, uh, you know, in, in plush offices. So, you know, making a little, a few bucks under the table, it's not, it's not hard to believe, especially when it's me. You know, everybody thinks the Home Alone Daddy's a millionaire. That money's gone. They got that money the first five years. You know, 20 attorneys. I just, I, all I did was I tried to buy an attorney that would go up against this judge. And finally, 30 attorneys got together and complained about her and her bias. And she was shuffled, but she still holds on to my case. She won't let the case come up here, you know. And the mother and you both have been in Ulster County for a decade, isn't that correct? Yeah. Yes. It, does, it doesn't matter, or the Hudson Valley at least, right? Yeah. You've been local. So it, that makes absolutely no sense. But unless people speak out about this kind of abuse by the judges, Nothing is going to change. It's yeah. uh, you know, we and need that's you. really the problem. And that's why I'm doing this because I certainly am not do. I'm not getting paid, and neither are any of you. And I appreciate all of you. You know, both of you coming here to talk about this stuff. So, um, I what I think though is I think that I would say that most people who have been in the court, it's their responsibility when they come out, like I came out. I said, I'm going to do something to change this, even if I, it's a very small piece of the puzzle. What happens is most people come out of it, and they just want to forget about it. And then nothing happens. And that's why these people in Albany are shuffling their feet. 
That's why everybody gets finished with it. No, it's time to rally around this cause. And I feel that the American people, the New York State residents who've been through divorce, have to bear some of the burden for these abuses. Because they're, by, they're not paying attention to who these judges are when they vote for them. God knows that's true. We have to pay more attention and scrutinize who's on that ballot in November. And believe me, if some, uh, you know, this November, if any family court judges in the Hudson Valley are up for re-election, I would like to hear from all you folks out there who've had dealings with them. Good and bad. I mean, it's time that this kind of thing was aired in a public forum. You've noticed that my TV show is ignored by the newspapers because they're in bed with the judges and lawyers. And that's why, you, you know, I don't even watch television. I mean, I'm doing this because most people do. But anyway, this is my beef with this. It's, and you get the justice system that you're willing to put the effort in to, to get. And, and we pay these people salaries, and it's time we, we demanded more of them. So maybe you can tell us, because it's you're the Father's Rights Association representative and your president, do you have any ideas about what people can do? And, you know, I know that, you know, maybe you want to say some... Well, definitely, I mean, the Father's Rights Association can give you a voice. I mean, you, when you walk into court as an individual, I mean, it's, it's already a losing battle. But if, if, if our organization can get the reputation that when you walk into court as a member of the Father's Rights Association, people will perk up their ears and listen, and that hopefully you will get equal treatment. And it's not just for men. It's for women. We have grandparents even in our organization who want to be with their children. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We want to be with our kids. We want to be able to see our kids. We want to parent our kids. And you, That's have, a, the you have a newsletter, don't you, that you send or some kind we of information? We meet every month. Um, my chapter covers Orange, Ulster, Sullivan, and Rockland County. We just started a chapter in Dutchess County. Okay. We have 18 chapters throughout the state. And we're so going to we have the website active. on the screen and the telephone number. So for those people who want information, how much does it cost to belong a year? Uh, our dues if you are like... $25 a year, and uh, if you can't pay it, I mean, we know a lot of guys are paying quite a bit of money through child support. That's not a requirement. You come to our meetings, you learn about the family court system. We can help you navigate through that uh, storm, if you will. Do you uh, have lawyers who devote um, pro bono time? We do. Time, a, like lot of, a lot of chapters have lawyers uh, that come to the meetings mm -hmm. that are very helpful and that are, that are, that are, that are good attorneys. Well, I, it sounds like, you know, you're doing a really great thing, and I'm I'm glad to have you here. I mean, it's taken two and a half years. I guess because I'm a woman, maybe some of the father's rights people were uh, afraid I was biased, <laughs> which is not the case. As, as John likes to point out, I got treated in court like one of the guys. Right. So anyway. The club. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the, the abuse cuts across sexes <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyway, uh, thank you both for joining me. Uh, I really... Uh, I found it very enlightening, and I hope that those of you out there will contact me at my website, joeannmichaels at ivillage.com, because I do check it once a week or once every other week. So I will get back to you eventually. Uh, and let me know if you would be willing to come on the show and talk about the judge that you had in your case, because we do need more of that. And things are not going to change until these people are exposed for what they are doing good and bad. Thank you very much for joining me, and good night.